plenary is over, it's my particular pleasure uh, to invite Professor Humphreys uh, to address us this afternoon. Thank you, thank you, James. Um, well, I'd like to thank the Economic and Social History Society of Ireland for inviting me to give this lecture and its president, James Kelly. I'd also like to thank Rebecca Stewart for her kindness and support in organizing the lecture. And of course, UCD for doing the technology be behind the scenes. I want to apologize to those members of the audience who work on Irish economic history. I'm uh, not an economic historian of Ireland, but I hope people will find something in the ideas and approaches and methodology that I'm going to talk about today that, that will be interesting. Um, my subject, which is the standard of living, um, would in fact be quite dear to the heart of Kenneth Connell. Um, so um, I think in that way, I'm honoring the distinguished economic and demographic historian um, that he was. So my topic is the historical standard of living. Um, I'm going to give you a brief bit of signposting um, so that you can follow the organization of the lecture. I'm going to talk um, for some time on the, uh, the mainstream approach, the way in which the standard of living is usually conceptualized and measured. And then I'm going to make a rather radical departure into um, the approach I'm going to pioneer today, which I'm going to call the board and lodging approach. I'm going to spend quite a lot of time on data um, because this is a very empirically based um, project. Um, and then briefly um, head up some preliminary findings. I should emphasize too that this is work in progress. This is not a kind of polished, finished product here. Product here. So, um, uh, you know, there will be some findings, but some of these may be quite tentative. And um, then uh, some conclusions. I hope we can come to some, albeit tentative, conclusions. Well, the mainstream approach to the standard of living, of course, is really material standards. Um, what we economic historians do is we talk about the goods and services that people could consume in different times and places. Um, and um, what people could consume is generally conceptualized as what people could earn and what they could buy with those earnings. So the standard of living really is wages divided by the cost of living or real wages as we denote them. And the focus by economic historians has been almost exclusively on men's wages. This reminds me of that Jimmy Kimmel joke, you know, where um, I remember a time when economic and social historians never talked about women. And the reason I can remember it is it was yesterday. Um, so the focus in the past has been almost exclusively on men's wages and their purchasing power and trends in real men's wages over time. And the reinterest in, in the standard of living, um, which has happened in the last 10 years, um, has led to an explosion in wage studies, as Jordan Claridge called it in his review of the periodicals literature in the Economic History Review um, in 2019. And so these kinds of diagrams here, this is showing some of the, of the um, conventional wage series here. These, these diagrams decorate our teaching resources and um, fill our journals. Um, well, of course, men's real wages are not the same as the standard of living. Um, economic historians are fully aware of that. And in fact, concern with um, these, the differences and the slippages here has led to a whole um, growth of a whole new area in terms of the discussion of the biological living standards. Um, James mentioned my colleague Roderick Flood, for instance, who pioneered the study of stature as an indicator of the standard of living. And some of my own work has been on living standards determined at the family level um, because, um, of course, not all families um, had male breadwinners who were resident and nor were men the only earners. So some of my work really has been devoted to trying to broaden out from men's real wages to family living standards. And in fact, two recent papers, 
uh, written with Sarah Horrell and Jacob Weisdorf, and now tried to pull together a lot of work on women and children's and men's wages to establish family living standards. Um, the, these papers are in past and present and forthcoming in the Economic History Review. But my topic today is not the numerator of the living standards um, story. I want to focus on what wages could buy. The cost of living index, which has received much less attention. And it's a shame it's received less attention because it's often where the action is when we're looking at the long run development of the standard of living. So what I'm interested in today then is the measurement of the cost of living, which is usually taken to be the same as the changing cost of a representative basket of commodities, with price changes weighed by the expenditure proportions derived from budget studies. And Robert Allen, who has really pioneered and promoted um, part of the, of the recent wave of interest in living standards, has defined two historical standards in terms of two baskets of commodities. The first is a physiological minimum, which he appropriately called the bare bones basket. And the second, he calls the respectability basket. And this was inspired by budget studies by Frederick Eden and other observers um, for respectable laborers in Britain and in the Low Countries um, in the 18th century. So this is actually the, the um, components of the Allen respectability basket. And it's my kind of kicking off point um, for today's lecture. Well, there has, of course, been critique and, and, and adaption of the Allen basket, um, according to, for instance, questions about whether the 2,500 calories which the respectability basket delivers is adequate. There's general agreement, I think, that the bare bones basket is really rather um, mean, um, given that many historical workers um, worked at very physically ar arduous jobs and required a significant um, number of calories. So um, there's a critique at that level in terms of what the basket can deliver in terms of nutrition. Um, historians have also tried, adapted the Allen baskets for local diets and also for local climatic conditions. So including, for instance, more fuel and warmer clothing, if in fact um, these, um, we're thinking of the, stand, of the cost of living in colder climates, for example. There's obvious deep and intractable problems in thinking through the cost of living. Um, and this is true even for ec economists who are working on um, the current um, situation. What goods should be included? What budget shares should be used to weight price changes? What prices should we use? Um, patterns of substitution, if some goods are rising in price, how will consumers respond by substituting um, similar kinds of, of goods which are not um, being inflated in price and so on? And when we expand the cost of living index to look at families' needs, then we get even greater problems because, of course, the scaling issues, um, there's issues to do with what are the goods and services in the basket um, of consumption that, in fact, are public goods within the family and so on. And these problems really multiply when we're looking at the past and over long periods of time. Nonetheless, the Allen basket methodology has been incredibly valuable to economic historians. It provides a historical template, which when combined with price data, helps establish comparative historical patterns in, in living standards. And it's really helped economic historians in terms of looking uh, comparatively across Europe and indeed across the world in terms of tracing out relative living standards. Um, and therefore contributed to our understanding of the great divergence whereby 
um, Europe um, pulls ahead of uh, other hitherto leaders, um, and the little divergence whereby Northwest Europe, in fact, moved ahead in terms of living standards. Um, Allen's uh, framework is thought of in terms of welfare ratios, which represent men's wages usually, divided by the cost of living index that is implicit in the Allen baskets. So um, I'm going to talk primarily in terms of comparative um, standards the, of the respectability basket. So a welfare ratio would, um, in Allen's terms, be in fact men's wages divided by the cost of the respectability basket. Um, and that's really um, the kind of baseline story here. But I also, in this lecture, want to draw attention to two further problems with the Allen basket. The Allen basket is a Las Perez index, by and large a Las Perez index. This means the composition of the basket is fixed and its cost changes only with changes in the price of the components of the basket. Now this is in conflict with certain grand theories of economic development, which rely particularly on the impact of new or of hitherto prohibitively expensive commodities trickling down the social structure and appearing in ordinary people's consumption baskets. And of course, the, the, um, the, the literature I want to refer to here is the literature on the industrious revolution, um, which um, a term used by Jan de Vries to describe how in fact it was desire for new kinds of commodities, um, better quality cloth, um, the new tropical groceries which were being imported from the new world um, and elsewhere, um, many of which had um, addictive qualities, sugar, tea, coffee, tobacco, um, these kinds of commodities, we want the, the desire for these kinds of commodities meant that ordinary people substituted the labor time from home, home production or from leisure to working in the market um, in order to gain the income to buy these kinds of commodities. So if we're working with a fixed composition to the basket of consumption, it's in conflict with this rather important um, and uh, widely um, accepted idea of economic development. But the Allen basket methodology reflects also another problem, and it's uh, one of the longest standing problems concerning women's economic roles. Who turned the foodstuffs in the basket into meals? Who made the fuel into warmth and light? Who mobilize that cloth into a comfortable bedding or in fact clothing. Um, we need to take account of domestic labor, the work turning baskets into an actual living. And here we come across a very standard, widely acknowledged, but not that much done about it, um, problem within economics. And that is the anomaly of unpaid domestic work. National accounts typically, from the very beginning of national accounts, excluded services which people render to themselves, as Alfred Marshall described it. And unpaid domestic labor is the most important of such services. Its exclusion from our national accounts is theoretically indefensible, as Pigou pointed out and illustrated with his, his, his um, point that if he married his housekeeper, national income would fall. So when a service is, is, is sometimes the subject of a monetary transaction and sometimes received because of ownership, the usual procedure is to include in national income an estimate of its value using a market equivalent, as Colin Clark pointed out. But this was not done with domestic labor. It was excluded from national accounts despite recognition of the anomaly 
And despite work by very many early feminist historians, uh, feminist economists, and some early attempts to value housewife services. And this ignoring of a significant amount of labor, which very productive and valuable, is what Lourdes Benaria has termed the enduring debate. Um, and it's the, the ignoring of domestic labor has persisted, um, although there have been important developments by development economists, by economic historians, and a hesitant response from US and government agencies who sought in satellite accounts to include domestic work. Well, I'm going to suggest here a new approach to living standards. Um, and it's an approach which builds on an established literature on the interstices of economics and philosophy. And this approach argues that living standards really are endogenous, um, that they, they um, can be identified by reference to local habits, customs and demands. This represents a rather radical departure from the standard methodology because I'm suggesting that the cost of living in terms of what it, what it is cost in fact to board and lodge working people of a respectable status. And I'm going to try and suggest that this resolves problems creating by the shifting composition of consumption and by the exclusion of the labor needed to transform the commodities in baskets into actual livings. But this approach builds on an established set of, of, of themes within economic theory. And you can see here, I'm going right back to Adam Smith, who said a linen shirt, famously said a linen shirt is not strictly speaking a necessity of life, but an 18th century laborer would regard it as in fact part of his respectable standard of living. And Amartya Sen, of course, has argued that the standard of living really is um, not issues of, not to do with issues of subjective search that can be read off the conventions of society. So what I'm arguing here is that such agreed standards are reflected in what it costs to board and lodge people of respectable standing. And if we can actually gather together evidence on what it costs to board and lodge people of respectable standing, we can in fact index what it costs to live respectably, the cost of a respectability basket. So let me emphasize then, the board and lodging approach argues that the cost of board and lodging measures the cost of respectable living in particular times and places and can be used to chart both regional variations and trends over time. Now, since board and lodging comprises a number of constituent characteristics, it's important to break down the contributory value of each to the overall cost. The baseline is the food and drink provided, but also very frequently lodging is also provided. And other kinds of services might then be included in the baskets of the cost of living as standards rose. I'm going to use later on in this talk some hedonic regression to try to identify the contributions of the most important characteristics of different baskets. But before that, I want to talk about the data that goes into the long to establishing a long run series of board and lodging costs, which can then be compared with other indices of the cost of living. And in this lecture, the evolution of the cost of the respectability basket. The gaps, the differences, the periods of divergence and the periods of convergence in board and lodging costs and 
the cost of the respectability basket will then reflect how respectable living is drifting away from the composition of the basket and will also reflect the contribution of domestic labor in turning these goods and services into actual livings. If we can use this to then identify the labor time that women employ to service a border and lodger, to turn raw materials in the basket into real livings, we can then value that labor time by market wages and value in this way women's domestic labor. If we can use the wages of married women, for instance, in the labor market, we can actually value the unpaid labor by and large that goes into respectable livings. I will come back to this point because it really is a bit tricky to grasp. So the first point is that my board and lodging costs involve a lot of work in archival um, with archival resources. I have now um, established over 3,050 observations of board and lodging costs taken from over 275 mostly printed primary or archival sources. And they're classified by type in the table um, that I've just put up on the slides. Um, and I just run through the types of source I'm using here to um, extract estimates of board and lodging costs. The first are simple accounts, accounts of institutions, accounts of church wardens, uh, parish accounts, accounts of employers. And these accounts, in fact, list the costs of boarding and lodging workers. Now to modernize this might look a little bit strange, but if you think of what, for instance, early modern England, medieval England was like, um, then with limited transport systems, workers couldn't commute. So it was very much often required to put them up when they came to work for you. So I've given you an example here of the Boxford church wardens, which are employing a plasterer for daubing the town shops. And he's paid his wages, but he's also paid for boarding in um, Boxford while he's doing this work. Farm servants, of course, were boarded routinely right through to the late 19th century. And this, of course, was partly because of the isolation of some farmers' houses, but it was also because it avoided muster costs. And the cost of board and lodging farm servants was very often noted by careful employers and recorded in their account books. Um, my third type of account is when, in fact, um, board and lodgings are directly costed in payments to third parties. So here I've listed as my example some observations derived from admiralty records where the admiralty is paying these women to board and lodge various um, workers um, on the Navy's fleets. But you can also find these kinds of payments in ordinary account books as well. And in some ways, these are the most um, reliable of all sources because these are direct payments, usually to women, for actually boarding and lodging workers. My fourth kind of account here drifts away, moves away from account books. And here I'm talking about the estimates of what it costs to board and lodge people provided by third parties. So social commentators, for instance, or the price assessments um, that uh, local authorities used to try and fix price ceilings on certain commodities to control the inflation that followed the Black Death. 
So we can use these as kind of exogenous estimates of what it would cost um, to feed um, and house workers. My fifth type of observation are the grain liveries that were provided on various medieval estates. So these were contributions to workers' subsistence. And you can value these in terms of, of grain prices. I'm moving slowly down the social structure here because when it comes to the sixth type of, of observation, I'm looking at the costs of billeting soldiers. Um, and of course, you might think soldiers are moving perhaps below our respectability focus. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful with this and with other kinds of estimates taken from, for instance, poor law records. So I was very careful, for instance, when using poor law accounts of what poor law authorities spent to board and lodge um, people to really pay, a, to, to, to be very selective and only look at um, people who were board and lodged by poor law authorities who had some kind of claim on respectability. My seventh type of account is when people boarded and lodged their, their kinsmen or um, ex-servants who they, they um, who served them for very long periods of time. So this example, for instance, is Agnes at Woad, who had been um, a servant on the Manor of Moat for many, many years. And so in her old age, she was boarded here. And pensions are included in this category too. Um, in the past, elderly people very often gave up some of their resources in order for maintenance contracts with their beneficiaries. And these provide rich detail on what goods and services were due the respectable and elderly, as we'll see later on in the lecture. And such contracts also often contain default clauses whereby a cash transfer could be substituted for the maintenance and so indexes the value of the goods and services that were to be received. An eighth kind um, of observation is derived from wage assessments, where I can look here at the wages that are provided with and without food and drink. And this is very similar to the second kind of observation found in an accounts, where again, we're using differences uh, provided to workers wages when they, those wages are accompanied by food and drink and wages, in fact, when um, the worker has to board himself or find his own table, as it's often described in the accounts. So the, the difference here really represents the value of board and lodging. So a 1724 Kent wage assessment, for instance, determined that the second sort of artificers were to get 14 pence per day in summer, or seven pence and their food, which suggests, of course, that their food is worth seven pence a day. And my final type of observation are board wages, which were provided to servants when employers closed up their houses, um, but they wanted to retain the services of those servants, so they provided them with an allowance to board and lodge themselves in the absence of their employer. Now, since most of this, uh, since a great deal of this lecture is about data, I'm going to now give you a, a brief tour of some of the kinds of records I've been working with. So here we have the household account book of Sarah Fell Swarthmore Hall. And boy, this lady is very good at accounts. She even includes in her accounts the sale of a half a cabbage. <laughs> so she's a very careful accountant. And here she's in fact accounting for money that she's paid to James Kendall's wife for in fact boarding and lodging mowers who were mowing at Gleeston and so away from home um, while they were doing this work. <laughs> 
sorry, I'm going the wrong way here. This um, is a receipt here. It's a, a receipt for, in fact, um, the receipt of uh, remuneration for day labor um, and for occasional board. And it's one of a whole bundle of receipts, a large bundle of these things in the records of John Talbot in the Wiltshire Record Office. So this is a kind of general receipt um, that you will find in very many um, estate records. One of my favorite documents is an agreement made by the pastor of the Cornish Methodist Circuit with Mrs. Amelia Thomas, who you can see here is not literate, she has to sign with a mark, but she's agreeing to provide washing, lodging, candles and meals of a specified standard for the young preachers. And these, this, these, these goods and services are costed up in the agreement. I thought I'd find lots of lovely evidence in newspaper advertisements, but in fact, newspaper advertisements turn out to be rather coy about the costs. Um, but this is a lovely example of um, somebody who wants to find um, board and lodging for an elderly gentleman of limited income, but he's fond of outdoor exercise and he wants a good plain table. And the, the terms, um, in fact, are described. One of the most wonderful types of record are these remises provided in what I described as maintenance contracts between generations. So here, Andon, who is a widow, is contracting with her son to provide her with maintenance. And she does so by saying she will in fact allow him um, a um, deduction on his rent for providing her with these goods and services. And, and she details what they are. Um, and she says, um, for these considerations, I allow him six pounds eight shillings yearly to be deducted from the rent. But notice that the canny widow um, has also given herself a get out clause, that if in fact these goods and services don't come up to um, the quality or standard that she wants, she will in fact um, require him to, to give up quiet possession. And Henry has the same kind of get out clause too. And finally, we have um, Duke Duck, his uh, receipt for his board wages. So this is a, a, a evidence then um, of um, the standard of, of a board wage, again taken from John Talbot's records in Wiltshire Record Office. All right, so. You've had a quick tour then of some of the archival resources. Here's a kind of summary of the data that's extracted. So 356 observations from over 270 sources here, mostly printed primary, as I said, or archival sources. And here in the stack bar chart, you can see I've color coded the type of observation. Of course, um, different types of observations cluster in time. So the grain liveries, for instance, are basically medieval. But very happily, accounts estimates really are found right through that very long run um, that, that James drew attention to, um, uh, that I'm trying to work with um, in this project. So accounts estimates are spread over the whole seven centuries. You can see there that the blue, the dark green, and the dark red um, colors occur um, right through um, the distribution. Well, now I want to just spend a little bit of time talking about whether these are credible estimates. Can board and lodging costs in these kinds of, of records be interpreted as measures of a respectable lifestyle? Were people in the past even cognizant of the kinds of food and accommodation they received? Were they watchful of its value and sensitive to the status it conveyed? Well, I think the answer is an emphatic yes. Um, if we look, for instance, at the autobiographical accounts of workers, we find them often discussing board and lodging and how it was how it was valued and whether there was a fair bargain with employers so john bennett for instance when he was an apprentice was persuaded by his employer to live in partly to 
reduce the costs of getting him going in the morning. But John Bennett did not like the food that was provided. And so he eventually negotiates um, with his employer to live out as an apprentice and receive a higher wage, which he then thinks he can put, use to buy a better standard of living. Employers were very aware of the costs of boarding servants. Robert Loder's farm account includes very detailed estimates of what it cost to feed and house his own live-in farm servants. And Loder's very clearly here trading off these costs against the higher wages you would have to pay for an agricultural labourer who lived out. Workers and employers can be seen bargaining around um, the inclusion and exclusion of board and lodging. So when George Culley was advising on whether to hire a specific servant, he asked, well, what does he expect with and without meat? And he emphasised, if he has his meat, that must be deducted. My favourite evidence for how these costs were genuinely integrated into um, contracts and their, and their robustness is in Mary Ann Ashford's comments about diet in her autobiography. She describes a Scots employer who is trying to stint her on a food. And in fact, she explains how the employer says, oh, Mary, you would be so much more handsome if you were, if your cheeks weren't so large. And maybe if you ate less, you would be thinner and more attractive. So Mary Ann Ashford records this employer. Of course, Mary Ann is too canny for the employer. And she, in fact, um, shifts her employment um, pretty soon after these comments and after the, the stint of diet. It's very clear from the um, evidence that skilled workers and those who were working long hours at heavy labour needed a respectability diet and lodging and were accorded of this. Um, the intergenerational contracts provide detailed specifications related to respectable status of recipients of board and lodging. So, for example, the maintenance that William Savage covenanted for his son was to be, quote, fitting his degree and quality, unquote. And the livelihood her son was to provide to Margaret Adams was to be, quote, convenient for a Christian. And the provision yeoman John Towson was to afford his widowed mother was to be, quote, fit for her station. So the board and lodging costs that I've picked up from all these diverse sources, I would argue, really do index what it cost to acquire a respectable standard of living. I've got anxieties, though, that I mentioned about evidence from poor law sources. This might, in fact, be dipping below the respectability standard that I'm interested in. And board wages may also be problematical because it may be that when they were paid board wages, servants were, in fact, required to do some residual work as well while their masters were away. More on that later. But this is what the estimates look like in terms of pence per day. I've reduced all these estimates to pence per day. And in fact, you can see them spread out over this long period of time um, that I'm involved in. I can talk in more detail about how, in fact, the, the estimates were um, treated and made consistent in the Q&A if people are interested. One very interesting, obvious first point is that men's board and lodging was generally um, higher cost than were the costs of women, um, the costs of mixed groups of workers, and of course the costs of children who uh, cost much less to board and lodge and accepted a much lower standard of board and lodging. Perhaps less obvious, but more interestingly, um, costs of board and lodging varied by skill in terms of their pence per day. And I've got a threefold category here, skilled, semi-skilled and unskilled. 
Again, I can go into detail about how I employed this, but essentially skilled workers are white collar, managerial or master craftsmen with men under them. Semi-skilled um, are people who had job titles, Mason, Thatcher, Carter, etc. And unskilled people are laborer, worker, servant, apprentice. Um, harvesters, I counted as skill because of their bargaining power um, and heavy labor that they undertook. And kin who were playing pensions, I also counted as skilled. So here's the cost of board and lodging in terms of a time trend. It's just the raw data in this graph. The green line shows the averages by decade of all my observations relative to um, the cost of the Allen respectability basket. Also in pence per day. What can we see from this? Well, obviously the cost of board and lodging is greater than the cost of the Allen basket. The gap indicates both the appearance within relative, indicates both the appearance within respectable lifestyles of different and more goods and services than appears in the Allen basket. It also picks up the cost of the labor time needed to turn the commodities into any basket, into livings. It's also picking up the cost of the labor time to turn those goods and so into um, living standards. Can we drill down into our story here and try and look more closely at the changing composition of board and lodging? Well, the records provide a historical commentary on the composition and construction of a respectable board and lodging. The earliest measures emphasize the basic diets, the grain liveries of medieval workers. So before the Black Death, really we've got um, a, a very basic diet provided in board and lodging. And this can be seen in the perquisites assured the Bishop of Chichester's Chamberlain at Battle Abbey before the Black Death. The Chamberlain himself gets a third robe, a decent room, a daily allowance of two loaves of simnel bread and one and a half gallons of convent ale and one and a half cooked dishes from the kitchen. But he also brings a servant whose living is more representative of the classes studied here. The servant was to have two loaves of black bread, a gallon of ale, and from the kitchen the same as the Abbey's servants, while he presumably dosed down dormitory, a telling comparison with his master's situation. The servant's package looks very like the respectability Allen basket if it's not sliding into the bare bones situation. But after the Black Death, respectable working people could expect higher standards, central to which was a movement to wheat bread. This can be detected in the grain liveries, but it's also evidenced in the accounts that detail the composition of the respectability basket. So by 1365, for instance, the Corridy of John Machen and his wife Edith specified a white loaf daily along with their gallon of ale and a pittance of food and drink from the priory kitchen. By 1500, even fillers of dung, low down on the respectability scale, could on the manner of Lord Bergavany expect bread and cheese and drink and sufficient for a laboring man all the day, and at the end of the day, his dinner. And two drinkings of, of ale, at the forenoon and bread and cheese and, and a dinner again, um, consisting of roast meat and other good victuals, meat for men and women in harvest time. And drink always during their work as need shall require. If you're thinking by this time, the workers wouldn't be able to see the harvest given all this ale that they're drinking, let me remind you this was very weak stuff. Now, harvest eating was, as Christopher Dyer has emphasized, at the apex of the agricultural laborers' gastronomic year. But other 
may also indicate the rising standards of respectability over time. In 1746, Susan Browning, aged 15, apprenticed to a local yeoman, ran away after a beating, only to return her homecoming made memorable because she was in time for Christmas dinner, which she remembered as a shoulder of mutton, a plum pudding, and some white cabbage and turnips. Now, working people didn't enjoy these indulgences daily, but the respectability diet had clearly moved beyond that implied by the Allen basket. As the food inputs into respectability mutated, so did other necessities, and this is really quite important. In 1476, a skilled and sought after craftsman who came to mend the organ in Pitt and Somerset received his wages and a similar allowance for his bed, fire and candle. Repose, warmth and illumination accepted as his due. But a new component was making headway into respectability. In 1490, John Thornton and his wife Margaret, in their maintenance contract, demanded not only food and house room, but washing and wringing cleanly and well. Laundry service had been added to the attributes of respectable living, which while staying in touch, had moved beyond the respectability basket components. After 1550, laundry services appear increasingly frequently in enumerations of the attributes of a decent life and are increasingly valued. Other emerging components might be overlooked by modern eyes. Chimneys, bedding, the comfort goods that Jan de Vries talks about, a separate chamber, some privacy, access to a privy, um, to some kind of lavatory, a means of transport, particularly to get yourself to church. These, in fact, are the increasingly important aspects of a respectable life. And by 18th century, we see new goods appearing. Thus, the will of a yeoman Thomas Pake in 1723 instructed his son to maintain his mother in clothes, meat, drink, washing and lodging with tobacco for a person of her degree. Tobacco's progress down the social scale is neatly illustrated by its inclusion in the maintenance of John Bland, a lunatic, unquote, supported by Kendall Poorlaw in 1757. Medical services and access to a physician also begin to appear in maintenance contracts. And for instance, Elizabeth Smurden and her son have a maintenance contract in which she, in fact, specifies um, access to uh, medicines. Around the same time, John Harrower, traveling from Scotland to London en route for the New World, and rather short of money, in Portsmouth enjoyed eight oysters, some bread, and two pints of ale, and then paid threepence for a bed warmed with a warming pan. And he says, it was the first time I ever saw it. The components of a respectable living had moved far away from the lifestyle implied by the re respectable Allen basket. And we can fit these qualitative insights into, into our, our um, quantitative account. So if here we're comparing the cost of the Allen basket um, with the cost of board and lodging, and we can identify the emerging gaps here. So that the gap here emerging around 1500s, I've associated with a more varied diet and with new services, for instance, the inclusion of laundry services. Another emerging gap here is to do with more protein included in the diet, new goods, coffee, sugar, etc. And the big gap opening at the very end of the time period is here driven by higher women's wages and more services included in the respectable lifestyle. The comfort goods that Jan de Vries says were so important um, in, in this time period.
However, remember that these board and lodging costs today are the raw data. And in fact, that, that series will be subject to some compositional effects. So for those economic historians in the audience who've been longing for a regression, here is a very simple regression, which looks at the cost of board and lodging um, as the dependent variable relative to, and I'm not, a, I'm not arguing for any causation here, I'm simply uh, suggesting an association, relative to the components of um, the basket, the types of estimates that, 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 that the um, observation is taken from, um, the scale of the recipient, um, the age and, and sex of the recipient, and in fact, um, basic uh, trends associated with women's wages and, and wheat prices. And this regression, although it's very simple, explains almost three quarters of the variation in the cost of board and lodging. Um, as we might expect, semi-skilled and unskilled men um, and, and, and workers are paid less than the skilled men, who are set the baseline here. And women, mixed groups and children um, get less in board and lodging um, than do men. And um, as far as types are concerned, this is very interesting that the, all the types of observations taken from accounts um, are not significantly different. There's no significant difference between um, the type of, 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 of the, the size of the board and lodging cost that appears directly in the accounts and the size of the board and lodging costs that are inferred when workers are given uh, food with their wages or when they're given um, a simple wage. So um, the accounts estimates are very much all from the same bundle. Um, but as I predicted, the estimates by social commentators are significantly lower than other types of estimates. So social commentators generally thought board and lodging of workers was uh, lower than, in fact, um, the, the estimate suggested um, by the by the um, by the accounts. One interesting thing here is that pensions are also statistically significantly lower, and, and board and lodging costs of kin. These observations work out as statistically significantly lower than accounts taken. Um, out of um, the estimates taken out of accounts. Um, and I, I'm slightly puzzled by that, but of course it is possible that these pensions um, are always supplemented by in-kind payments that are not included um, in, in the, the um, monetary evaluations. Trends here are driven, you can see that the, the trend, the wheat price, um, is uh, also effective, suggesting statistically significantly associated with the cost of board and lodging, suggesting that basic food prices did play a role here in, in driving board and lodging costs. Um, but the provision of washing and the provision of lodging too adds increasingly to the value of board and lodging over time. And the same is true of women's wages. So one penny on women's wages adds very little to board and lodging costs early in our time period. But since this variable here is trended, what this means is that over time, one pound in women's wages is adding more and more to board and lodging costs, suggesting that there's more labor time being put into um, board and lodging. materials into warmth and comfort and food and meals is really um, increasing in terms of the time that is taken here. So if we take, and here I've now standardized these, this board and lodging costs here is using the coefficients from the regression equation. So this is the cost of board and lodging. And semi-skilled man who has lodging included in his package, not washing, but lodging. So that's what his cost of board and lodging looks like over time. 
And this is male day wages taken from Greg Clark's 2007 long run series. And again, you can see the gaps here um, are very similar. They occur at similar epochs as the gaps between the raw data. Um, so that you can see there are, uh, uh, the, the, if we were to put on the, the, sorry, if we were to put on here, this, this, um, the cost of board and lodging, this unskilled man is, is generally not that different from the raw data itself, the raw data of the cost of board and lodging. But by comparing it with male day wages taken from Clark's long run series for agricultural workers, we can actually work out the welfare ratio. That is how many board and lodging baskets could a male day wage buy? And this is really shown on this panel of the graph then. So this shows um, the uh, really the male day wage divided by the cost of board and lodging. And you can see here that during the medieval period, the male day wage can just about support himself um, if he has to pay board and lodging costs, if he has to pay not only for a basket of foodstuffs, but he also has to pay for a domestic worker to in fact transform that into a living standard. So the welfare ratios here then are actually very similar in certain phases of time to welfare ratios derived from the main, as presented by mainstream accounts. We see a huge boom in welfare. So that in fact, in the middle of the medieval period, we find that an unskilled man could in fact buy almost two, one, certainly one and a half, board and lodging baskets. He could pay for himself to board and lodge at least once and have 50% of a board and lodging basket left over. This, of course, is, a, so is the golden age of the English peasantry. This is the boom in the standard of living that all <laughs> wage data and all cost of living indices that this doesn't last. Of course, this is the, the demographic collapse associated with the Black Death. Population slowly recovers, bringing down wages. But then we get another improvement here around 1600. And then, in fact, another dip. comparing wages um, and allen baskets we would see the same kind of boom perhaps even more exaggerated but this part of the story is rather different here we see in fact a boom associated with um, an improvement in wages when in fact respectable aspirations perhaps have not been built into the costs of board and lodging. But here we see, in fact, a decline in the later time period when, in fact, we might say that um, this dip, which is not, over, not really overcome until the late 1800s, this is when the aspirations are perhaps running ahead of wages so that um, really we find that the welfare in terms of what people expect to enjoy is not um, increasing as rapidly as we would as, as would be suggested by the orthodox welfare ratio um, i think I'm, I'm running out of time so what i would just like to do is say in conclusion that um, one of the other things i've tried to do here and this is very rough is to identify the value of the domestic labor that goes into respectable living standards. And I've done this by using the regression coefficient to identify the proportion of women's labor time that goes into supporting one board, 
order or lodger and then costing that proportion of labor time up according to market wages. So this column here represents the market equivalent of the unpaid domestic labor in respectable respectability per adult male worker in terms of pounds per annum. If we then go to the social tables, and these are famous social tables, Gregory King, Joseph Massey, Campbell's medieval social table, and we try and identify the number of respectable households in society, we can then multiply the market equivalent of the unpaid labor in respectability standards by the number of respectable households and look at it as a contribution to total income. So this represents a first guesstimate of the contribution to total income of unpaid domestic labor. It's very rough. I'm not satisfied with the underpinning estimates of the contribution to board and lodging costs of women's work. And this table also includes only domestic work. It doesn't include childcare or subsistence production. And it relies on estimates of the proportion of all households that are considered respectable from the social tables, which are very difficult to do. And it only includes the domestic labor provided to respectable households. It assumes that lower class households had much lower standards and therefore much less valuable unpaid household work. And more elevated households employed servants to do their domestic labor and so paid for their domestic labor. And so it's included in total income in the first place. So really, um, this is where I'm going with this, with this project, but it does need more work in order to refine it. But um, you can see that um, this, we might expect the contribution to total income in medieval times to be very low because there really wasn't a lot of cooking and cleaning and housework that could be done given the low standards um, of basic life. And we would expect, in fact, that if the contribution to total income of domestic work would be increasing um, over time. So the, the, the trend here is really um, rather convincing. So let me conclude then. What I've tried to do here today in this lecture is provide the first estimates of long run variation in board and lodging costs. And I've taken these as indicating long run trends in what was needed for a respectable living. By focusing on the costs of board and lodging, I've circumvented the problems with Lesperi's cost of living indices that these indices hold the composition of expenditure fixed. They don't allow for new goods and services entering into living standards. And that's completely out of kilter with many interpretations of macroeconomic developments. The border lodging costs also include domestic labor. And I've tried to use the basic border lodging costs to extract the contributions of domestic labor, both in terms of labor time and the cost of that labor. Divergence and convergence in border lodging costs and the costs of unrespected respect respectability baskets then suggest periods when new goods edged into respectable livings. And I tried to then benchmark that also against qualitative evidence of the appearance of new goods. And by comparing board and lodging costs and the costs of Allen respectability baskets, um, you can actually also then compare welfare ratios based on orthodox measures of the cost of living. And welfare ratios based on board and lodging costs. And these suggest that rising expectations could have muted the improvements implied 
by, for example, welfare ratios based on Allen baskets late on in the time period that we've surveyed here. And tentatively, in conclusion, I've also identified some market equivalents for domestic labour and so began to construct the first guesstimates of the contributions of unpaid household work to total income. Thank you very much. I hope that you have some questions and comments. Thank you. I just unmuted myself. Uh, thank you very much, Jane. That was superb. I did point out at the outset that just given the sheer duration of the time, of course, when you're trying to follow these, these trends, that this was going to be a formidable piece of, of work. It certainly is an exceptionally um, ambitious. Uh, what uh, struck me so extraordinary is the sheer number of observations upon which you've drawn and the range of sources upon which uh, they are derived in, in turn. So we have uh, some time. I don't want to obviously uh, extend uh, unnecessarily the, uh, the time that we would draw on your expertise for, for discussion. And we would be grateful if uh, you would entertain some uh, discussion in that, in that sense. So, uh, I will uh, endeavour now to uh, follow uh, the uh, take the questions that come from the uh, the floor. Uh, could I ad ad remind uh, the audience that if they wish to comment or present questions, that they use the, the chat function? They'll come up, and I will act as as as, as a, a mediator in 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 that respect. Um, and so, uh, what did, one of the first questions that has well. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Krum Kogroda uh, commenting uh, what, what the it was a great honour that we have you, Professor Humphreys here to speak to us uh, this year to give this, this lecture. Um, now, in terms of a question, uh, first one is presented here is from Chris Colvin, who's a member of the Society, uh, who asks, <laughs> quote, what explains the increase in the dispersion of board and lodging costs across time? There is a large increase at the top end and average, but at the bottom end, nothing much seems to change from eyeballing your point estimates. Yes. Um, is that a yep. fair uh, ob ob observation? Given your regression estimates, does the answer lie in the possibility that your data becomes more diverse across time, including more women, greater range of professions, etc.? Um, yes, this is a good point. Um, there is increasing dispersion over time. Um, I the composition of the uh, in terms of of women children men is actually quite in the raw data it's not that unstable and um i have uh, used the regression coefficients to standardize to try and get rid of um, compositional shifts um the result doesn't look very different what well, doesn't look very different from the raw data so um I, I, I have used, you know, I have worked on, on trying to um, eliminate some of the compositional factors here. Um, the dispersion um, is interesting and worrying, but um, I'm, I, and I don't really know what, would, what does explain it. Um, I think that, that one, one issue is that children's board and lodging costs are really rather sticky so they are staying at the bottom end of the distribution here but it's not simply um it's not definitely not just a result of composition um there is a broad maybe this is yet another sign of increasing inequality um that would be somewhere um that i would a direction in which i would like to go um, to explain that kind of divergence of course, we could take here, um, you know, the, 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 the view that at low levels of income, there isn't much scope for much divergence, much variation. Um, dispersion is, is limited simply by the, the low standard. 
And as standards change and improve, then there is scope for much greater dispersion and much greater inequality. So you could read the dispersion in the board and lodging costs as, in fact, another manifestation of inequality here. Um, and it would be interesting also, I am interested in looking at the skill differential in the board and lodging costs. So is it that skilled men, for instance, um, can pull away um, in terms of what they can command in, uh, for board and lodging, um, pull away from unskilled men? Um, that would be another uh, manifestation of increasing inequality. I don't know, Chris, if that begins to answer your question, but... Well, unfortunately, we cannot. He, he, Chris, no, and Chris, he'll probably come back. But I'd left. I'll scroll down through his comments, and we, we, we in a second. It doesn't allow for. Uh, in terms of the rest of the subsequent comments, basically, there are several people applauding uh, you, uh, metaphorically speaking, indeed regretting that they can't do so in person. Yes. Uh, fascinating from Simon Wegg in City, New York. It's more sincere. It's, uh, most thank you, most sincerely. Fascinating daughter. The data now, Joyce Burnett. Uh, this is a uh, more focused uh, question, quote, you estimated the value of unpaid labour as a percentage of national income. Yeah. Uh, well, could you, and that's, I presume that's the, the, uh, the, the data in the, in, the, in the slide towards the end. Yeah. Uh, but could you estimate the contribution of the woman's labour to a male breadwinner's, to a male breadwinner family? Yes, you, I, I could do that. That's a, that, would be a, um, that would be actually quite a, a useful way to go. Um, mm. Because I use the regression um, coefficients to estimate the proportion um, of a penny increase in, in, a, in the woman's wages, what that adds to board and lodging costs. And then I assume that represents the proportion of a woman's labour time. That... Uh, um, is required to support one adult male bordering lodger. And then I've multiplied that by married women's wages to look to try and gauge the, the value of unpaid domestic labour. Um, but of course, it is assuming that what a woman would, would use to support, what a woman, the time a woman would need to support one adult male worker is the same as the time she would use to support that worker and the family. As I pointed out, there's no childcare costs in, in, in this um, estimate yeah. of the value of domestic work. So, um, and I did point out too, that there are scaling issues when you move from talking about a single male worker or a single individual worker to talking about family standards. So there are scaling, just as it would, there are issues about scaling, um, you know, in, how much income is needed. So there are issues about scaling how much domestic labor would be needed for a family as opposed to a single worker, um, which I've captured through the board and lodging. So good question, Joyce, but um, tricky, tricky to answer it. Yeah, yeah. Well, there have been several comments about Maria Murphy saying gross thing meaning wang thank you so much interesting Sean Connolly wonderful talk that follows a, 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 a equally interesting question quote I wondered about what determines the cost of board and lodging you consider male wages in terms of what board and lodging they can pay for but how far is the cost of board and lodging uh, what a household will charge for giving up some of its privacy and taking on the labor of cooking and washing etc how is that determined by what the market will bear? Well, I mean, that, that gets to the nub of, of really what I was trying to do. That yes. I, I was looking at board and lodging costs, um, taking them from a vast number of different records, and then trying to relate those costs to the components um, of uh, board and lodging. So, um, you know, were the costs higher if lodging was included, were the costs higher if um, washing was included, um, how did the costs vary over time, um, and then, um, you know, how did the costs vary like, by um, skill level. Um, this, this 
really is getting to um, the nub of what I was trying to do here. Now, whether or not there, uh, I mean, yes, I would assume that there is a, I did argue that arbitrage clearly played a role. Workers were busily arbitraging mm -hmm. between wages and food as a package um, or, you know, wages separate when they would then have to buy their own food. So I think there is certainly a market here that would, that is what justifies my interpretation of board and lodging costs as indicating respectable standards, that what it costs to, to obtain a respectable living. Thank you. Uh, uh, Conrock uh, God is, is, has come with a question, in fact, two questions, uh, but pre preliminary observations, so much to digest and absorb, which is absolutely a statement of, of fact. Uh, question one, uh, the more methodological one perhaps, why not focus more on your annual labour income rather than daily wages and the problems associated with the latter? Uh, and while you're pondering that for a second, Jane, the second... <laughs> um, he's he's I, referring I here to, to um, our, a recent study um, with Jacob Weisdorf where we look I... at annual incomes as opposed to um, day wages mm. multiplied by 250 mm. days in the working year as assumed uh, working year in order to get to annual incomes. Um, and yes, indeed, um, I probably should move on to, to look at annual incomes. But the problem is that the board and lodging costs yeah. are given by the day. So yeah. I was by and large or by the week or by the, so I'm either have, going to have to aggregate up the board and lodging costs to an annual yeah. cost, or in fact, um, move to a day rate um, by looking at the weekly costs and assuming seven days in the week and so on. So your answer there is simply that um, the, the vast majority of board and lodging costs come uh, by the day. So I, I worked with um, day wages and I actually took Greg Clark's um, adult male wage series um, just to uh, try and, and bring in some kind of exogenous benchmarks um, rather than sticking with my own work um, all the time. Yes, I'm going to basically one assumes to, to some degree of wages are given in, in calculated in short, such short terms they don't always extend beyond the short term. Nice. Cormac's second question, uh, and this is one of the, the inevitable outcomes of looking at things across this range. In terms of broad secular trends, is Cormac's words, what are the main revisions here? Does the apparent rise in living standards during the 16th century go a bit against the grain? Mm. Well, one can extend that basically then the decline in living standards that follows during a period of often seen as more economic activity. But anyhow, never mind me. In yeah. terms of broad secular trends, what are the main revisions? Does the apparent rise in living standards from the 16th century go a bit against the grain? Are you? Yeah, the decline of living standards after the Black, well, the Black Death, the, the boom in living standards associated with the Black Death is comforting um, because it suggests that my board and lodging approach is not out of kilter with the conventional yes. approach. I'm not suggesting here that the board and lodging approach should replace a conventional standard of living story which uses a cost of living index. Um, but it's a different, it's a, a different and, and perhaps more um, culturally based um, approach to the standard of living story. So the fact that we can see the golden age of the English peasantry written in this data is comforting. Um, I would say that, that one of the main um, revisions is that perhaps the early modern period needs closer attention, both in terms of the way in which baskets are constructed and the prices mm -hmm. are estimated. And I would also suggest that um, the um, improvement in living standards associated with um, the, the late 18th, early 19th century, perhaps also needs revision because aspirations there were running um, pari passu with improvements in wages. So, you know, people had aspirations to respectable lifestyles and that included um, access to to comfort and domestic comfort. Um, and this is very consistent with Jan de Vries's argument about the 19th century, seeing um, a pursuit, a quest for clusters of comfort goods um, within the home. 
So, uh, you know, I, I think that there are some nice revisions here that actually hang on to um, other interpretations of long run economic development. Thank you, uh, David Mitch. Uh, comments, terrific Hello, lecture. Thank, thank you so much. Now, this back to the earlier period, and, uh, and this is some of the, the premises upon which you must pursue an inquiry. Basically, he was inquiring anyhow if, if in the earlier period there would be, be more presumption that people would get food and clothing from informal sources, gardens, hunting, homespun clothes that would not show up. In other words, that there wouldn't have a, an obvious associated cost. Um, but uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I, I, well, I'm not sure how that would, I don't think that would impact on the um, data collection um, and the, my, my basic faith in this data in terms of using the cost support and lodging to index what people thought was a respectable living. Um, I, I agree with you, with, with David, that there are some sources of um, self-provisioning, um, subsistence production available to people, but I'm not sure how it impacts on the story that I've told today in terms of providing an alternative um, to um, a cost of living index that simply relies on a fixed basket um, and changes in value only because the prices of those um, eternal components change. And it's a measure of, of, of the excitement your talk has generated. The, the questions are coming in thick and fast. I'm not, we're not going to get, get through them all. I'm not going to be, be exhausted, first of all. But there's one thing that uh, perhaps is material. Uh, Mark Sporer, uh, why are there fluctuating gaps between nominal wages and the monetary equivalent of board and lodging? Should one expect the two? Should shouldn't one expect the two time series to move together? Or this is the, or do they reflect, in your view, possible measurement errors by Clark, Allen, etc.? Um, and this is some question about a regional variation. But let's start just focus the, on the, the first part. The board and lodging costs do move in line. To, I mean, they do trend in a similar way to male wages, um, whether these are annual wages or. Um, day wages so the I, I don't there are short run variations short run i did i i'm sure that a lot of the short run um divergences and uh, are associated with um problems with the board and lodging data it's much more likely that there are problems with board and lodging data than problems with the wages data um but um the what I tried to suggest was that where the gaps are opened or closed also tells us that the costs of board, that, 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 that perhaps the underlying structure of respectable lifestyles and what we should be thinking people were consuming was also shifting and changing. Um, and also, of course, women's wages, trends in women's wages are going to have had an impact through the cost of those domestic services that, that went into providing board and lodging, that went into providing um, turning the raw materials into um, the, the comfort goods um, that boarders and lodgers enjoyed, the living standards that boarders and lodgers enjoyed. I say, I mean, in, in anticipation of the question after next, which is about the, the impact of your research on how we understand the Industrial Revolution, there's a quick one here, perhaps, uh, from uh, Aaron Spinney, and who inquires, do you reckon that the, uh, the Admiralty has been stingy in the name of the economy? So that actually may account for, I think maybe you won't say a yes or no answer, but perhaps a, a quick answer might, might suffice there. Uh, in other words, how, how are they reliable as uh, in terms of the accuracy for the particular point in time in which they which they provide evidence? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. How reliable are? I are I, sorry, I'll I, I, I give it the words of the questioner rather than me trying to interpret it and make a mess of it. I was wondering about your use of admiralty records as an estimate of cost for boarding. Uh, 
do you have any indication the Admiralty is being, quote, stingy, end of quote, in the name of economy? Yeah, the words well, that they are. Um, I, I did say that I was a bit nervous about using billeting costs, um, for instance, for the same kind of reason, you know, were, were, were they, did they have market power too, if they were employing lots of, of women to provide these board and lodging costs for a large number of, of male workers. Um, but again, this goes back to one of the earlier questions was, was there a market here? And therefore, were board and lodging costs, you know, um, subject to some market kind of discipline? And I, I certainly think that there was competition um, to um, both access board and lodging and competition to, to, to provide it. It was useful work for women. So I, 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 I think, you know, the Navy and the Army, when they were involved in billeting or lodging um, sailors or workers on the fleets, um, had market power in these port cities, for example, yeah. or in, in, you know, garrison towns. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not sure that they, um, that they were, were, were particularly stingy. Of course, they needed those workers to remain efficient. And so, um, you know, naval diets, for instance, were, were enormously high in protein. Um, we know that. So uh, maybe, maybe the board and lodgings were, were not um, so stingy. Now, I think we've got two questions left. So I, this one is a, is a, is a biggie, though. Uh, this is Hong Jiang, Jiang Hong. Thanks, etc. I have an extended question. How did the trends which your research discover impact the Industrial Revolution? Robert Allen suggests that increasing labour wages contributed to urgent demands for machines. How did the changing standard of living contribute to economic growth in the early modern time? Ooh, I yeah. think perhaps you might want to. <laughs> um, very big question. Yeah, of course. I mean, this is, uh, you know, the relative factor prices stimulates capital investment story. And, um, you know, I have I have my agreements and my disagreements with Bob on, on that point. Um, so I but I don't think they're particularly um, apropos for dis this discussion, which is, you know, basically um, offering um, some kind of nuance um, some kind of alternative perspective on the cost of living and um, the cost of the respectability basket in particular. Um, now, the final question I'm going to pose this, this evening, and it was Mary O'Sullivan again, many thanks. That was really stimulating. I was struck by the fact that some of the increases in your index in the early modern period seem to reflect changing expectations of cleanliness. Yes. Respect that's the issue of laundry services, but I think they, the fascinating thing is how your paper is revealing different expectations. But anyhow, any thoughts on what was driving down the tolerance for filth and odours, uh, which perhaps is going beyond your remit, but any thoughts well, you might I, have? No, I'm medical? really interested in laundry services because, of course, you know, we've got this vision now of the past as being very filthy and disgusting. Um, and I'm, I'm not, not convinced that people didn't seek to have greater cleanliness earlier than um, conventional historians would suggest. So the conventional history suggests. Um, I was looking at, at uh, some uh, accounts of a noblewoman whose whole household only spent 12p on laundry. This is very early on um, in, in my time period. They only spent 12p on their laundry services. But since her underwear was made out of sheepskin, um, I hope there was some other way <laughs> that they could actually find um, to clean her underwear. But um, yes, Mary's quite right. I have traced through the where we get detailed breakdown of what is um, considered as part of a respectable board and lodging provision, it will include laundry services increasingly over time. It, it, these are specified and not just washing, but we saw one of the cases, I, one of the observations I detailed involved ringing, starching is mentioned. Mm -hmm. And even oh, very ordinary people are requiring, demanding, pursuing laundry services um, late on in the period. So for instance, I've just been reading George Haywood's diary, who is a grocer in Manchester um, in the very early 1800s. 
and he takes on a, a young worker, an apprentice, and the apprentice's mother tries to negotiate that he will do the lad's washing, that the lad's washing will be done um, within his household as part of the employment bargain. Um, and Hayward's saying, no, I'm not going to take on the responsibility of that. The, the, that's costly. So clearly what washing, you know, of clothing, of bedding, um, was, was really becoming um, part of respectable status um, in, in this time period. Um, as well as, I mean, being dirty, being very unclean is not very comfortable. And so, you know, the pursuit um, of, and, and we add to this John Mulcair's point that, you know, once, once you get into um, a a, a medical context where cleanliness is associated with disease, then of course it becomes ever more important to uh, the quest for cleanliness is really part of the quest for respectability. Yes, that's manifestly. Look, I will draw the questions to a conclusion at this point. Jane, you've been heroic. And thank you ex exceptionally for, for the well, for the manner and fashion you dealt with the questions having provided this such a, an exceptional uh, view on across such a wide range of periods. There's so many things that one can, can, can draw out. I mean, I personally was utterly captivated by the manner and fashion in which you were able to re release, this ties into in the, the last question there, the manner and fashion in which the uh, rising standards of respectability could be tracked and identified and the burdens of laundry services, the greater reliance upon privacy, the embrace of luxury goods, the adoption of a, of a medical dimension. I mean, it's a, it's, it offers a, a whole new perspective uh, on the, the, the emerging society and the potential that has, has for how we can sort of provide an integrated history or how we, economic history can inform and guide and shape so much else. Uh, and this goes from just looking at the from the minor perspective, such as I, mean, I was intrigued by the that a document from Kent, in which we seem to suggest that fifty percent of bread and of, of board and lodging was devoted to food, yes. uh, which as a which as a statistic, if it's a reflects the point in time in, at the at the at that moment, mm -hmm. I mean, is a, provides another benchmark by which we can assess disposable income. But, but overall, given the the, the 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 sheer number of, of data points that you're able to to establish and the, the 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 acuity and and detail uh, with which uh, people kept accounts is uh, equally uh, revealing i think this tells us something else about the people in the society but it obviously it provides data of which for a long time perhaps we haven't before its vision notice or attention to and uh, which can be utilized to 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 great effect and in that context i mean i think one of the hopes arising out of the the lecture to this this, this afternoon was that it would uh, provide uh, sort of suggestions particularly that perhaps graduate students and others might want to to employ i think our wishes in that sense have been uh, greatly and amply uh, gratified i'm sure uh, Ken and Connell, who are sitting here, given the forensic closeness with which he through scrutinised sources uh, would, uh, would 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 approve. I now, I would just as a final word, just like obviously not only just to, in addition to thanking our speaker um, who deserves uh, <coughs> most of our, our applause and, uh, and and congratulations, to thank the audience, uh, which we have got a substantial. Uh, audience this afternoon, certainly larger than we would have, we could have been able to put in a hall at the, uh, the, the, the lecture was held in, in, in person. Uh, and in terms of the technical backup, which is, uh, and the supports, which, and for the organisation that made to making this occasion a uh, success, I wish to uh, affirm and note in public my particular thanks to Roshin Coley, to Anya Doran, and not alone to the indomitable Rebecca Stewart, uh, who has been so uh, important in making this occasion a success. So I thank you all. It's only a pity we can't sort of mill around and chat informally. And uh, this is the one dimension on, uh, on Zoom and uh, that's no longer perm perm permissible. But other than that, I think it's been a splendid, a splendid afternoon. Thank you all very much. Thank you.